Good afternoon to you. Mark Suttoth, HurricaneTrack.com, here with your off-season edition of the Hurricane Outlook and Discussion for the 28th day, the last day of February 2017. Hope you're doing well. I have a new way of doing things today. Going to have a webcam image. For what it's worth, kind of show you me for a change, get to know me a little better in terms of, you know, I could just do a screencast all the time, but being able to see me and I can talk with my hands a little bit more here and you can kind of see again for what it's worth uh, especially when something's coming a hurricane or something you know big kind of the emotion in the way I talk uh, beginning and ending or in the middle if I need to come in and maybe get a point across I think it's good to be able to connect more face to face so hello and goodbye so I'll pop up again at the end so let's get on with it now that you've seen my mug for what it's worth third time I've said that you can see I'm not typically used to being seen, so eh, we'll get used to it together. Anyhow, it is the last day of February, and boy, things have been pretty much far from it in the eastern United States in terms of winter, and a big part of that has to do with sea surface temperature anomalies affecting different patterns in the atmosphere, and everything's connected, as I've talked about quite often. Uh, so here's what we have for the latest update. This was uh, updated yesterday, and I got a new toolbar that I also need to, oh, no, we don't want to exit, get used to here. All right, so let's zoom in. This area throughout the equatorial region of the Pacific, starting to warm just a little bit, a little bit more than usual. Still have the cold pocket out here in the central Pacific. The Atlantic Basin, we're getting colder in the eastern Atlantic, but the western Atlantic still very, very warm, as we have seen in the last uh, couple of years, really. The Atlantic Basin, not as much in what we call the warm AMO or the Atlantic Multidecadal Oscillation, but much more warm uh, basically west of 60 degrees longitude over here. Gulf of Mexico still running at record levels, and then this ribbon of very, very warm water up here along the northwest Atlantic. You know, so things interesting in terms of how they're evolving. No major change in the, uh, changes in the Atlantic Basin, uh, but this warming in the Pacific we'll talk about more in just a moment. All right, so looking now down in the Gulf of Mexico, again, this area, this is a close-up, except for the loop current right here, which is for some reason below where it should be, the rest of the Gulf is running at near record levels, and uh, boy, the Northwest Atlantic, just as warm as it could be, and we've had that ridging over the east now for some time, which helps to sort of thwart these cold fronts from coming down, and as such, it's been very, very warm, uh, down here in Florida, and certainly the eastern third. We had a little bit of winter up here in New England, three nor'easters in a row, and that's it. Snow's melted for the most part, except up in the mountains for sure, but uh, very warm in the east, and the warm Gulf of Mexico, I think, has a lot to do with at least some of this, because you know, all this anomalous warming that you see here helps to promote that ridging and kind of keeps winter at bay, and it's been pretty much focused out west. So we will keep an eye on this, see how the Gulf responds over the next few weeks. And, of course, once we get into hurricane season, that will be especially important. So the SOI, Southern Oscillation Index, an important driver in the pressure patterns and what happens, sort of like a bullwhip effect. I've heard Joe Bastardi, you know who he is perhaps, uh, talk about that. So I don't want to make it sound like I came up with that idea. But it makes sense that you have a strong shock to the system at point A and that points B, C, D, E, and F or whatever downstream along that bullwhip as you whip it, right? You have these waves of energy that travel across it. And the SOI can do similar things if it's very strong or very negative. It's when it's near neutral that the weather generally behaves itself. So where are we as of late? Well, right now the daily contributor... 4.56, and uh, the 30-day will end up here. Well, look, February, there it is. I've already calculated it. Minus 2.24. So we've definitely had a downward trend over here uh, since December, and some are speculating with good cause, good reason, that we may be headed towards an El Nino again. So let's take a look at why that may be the case. This is the very latest in the subsurface anomaly in the equatorial region of the Pacific and I want you to notice here, yeah, you still have this large bowl 
of neutral through this region, but that is surrounded at depth, you know, still pretty far down in the ocean, by warm or positive anomalies, and we don't really see any large areas of 4, 5, and 6 degrees Celsius like we saw back in 2015 when there was just this huge blob that was coming out and had all these contours of very, very warm uh, off the top of the scale here, and that moved its way from west to east and eventually re reached the surface, and we had a major, major El Nino. In this case, it seems like the eastern Pacific's trying to warm a little bit. Then you've got this area in the western Pacific, and then the area of cold up here with, you know, just marginal cooling. So it's a different type of setup, a different El Nino, if you will, uh, than what we saw in 2015, lasting into last year. And so this is what the INSO regions look like. I talk about this from time to time, and I finally remembered to pull up a map to show you. So the INSO region, El Nino Southern Oscillation, divided into these different areas. Um, like I said, it's kind of like a, a Venn diagram, but not really. If you remember math and all that, Venn diagrams, how fun were those? Uh, Nino 1 and 2 area, and this one's very warm right now. Uh, and then you have your large area of Nino 3. And these are just regions that they, div that they divide the Pacific, climatologists, oceanographers, meteorologists, and geographers like me. And then you have your Nino 3-4 area, which, again, like that Venn diagram, was an overlap of Nino 4 and Nino 3. And it's this area that the most attention gets paid to in terms of warming. You say, okay, now let's go back and look at the uh, previous under uh, underwater, the uh, subsurface map. So the Nino 3 area is, uh, the 3-4 area, sorry, through here, uh, more or less through here, still showing cool for the most part, and maybe a little warm on the western edges. But basically, it's just this region right here, the Nino 1 and 2 region uh, back on this map that we really have to say is warming significantly right now. The rest of the area is kind of ho-humming along, and we'll see what happens. I think that the bottom line, as long as we don't get sort of a basin-wide El Nino that looks like this, where all the areas are just scorching warm, then it probably won't have that much of an effect on the Atlantic hurricane season. And, you know, the reasons being we can talk about, as I've teased, if as we get closer, if it's going to come to fruition. No reason to speculate for something that hasn't happened yet. And the models are basically 50-50 that we'll have an El Nino by the fall. So we'll keep watching it, all right? So this is the latest in the actual sea surface temperatures. Zoom back out a little bit here. For those of you in uh, March, later in March, hopefully, uh, that spring break commences. Some folks, it comes up the first couple of weeks. My son goes to North Carolina State, and I believe he's out from the 7th until whenever. So maybe it is early March. But uh, water temperatures warming up a little bit down here along the shelf water, which is normally pretty cold. But then down in the southeast gulf, there's your 26 degrees Celsius line, and even the Bay of Campeche. Uh, Cozumel, Cancun down here, Northwest Caribbean, very, very warm, warmer than it should be, as I showed you earlier on the anomaly chart. And the same is also true here in the western Atlantic, pockets of 25 degrees Celsius water showing up as far north as north of 36 degrees latitude. And to put that in English, basically the water temperature is in the upper 70s right there just off the North Carolina Outer Banks and the Virginia Tidewater. That's crazy. So all of this very warm water up here, I think, had a part in, again, help, helping to change the way the pattern works and the, the troughs and ridges. Maybe I'm off base on that, but, boy, when you got all that warm water out there, uh, it tends to keep things warm around you, I guess, is the logical way to look at it. There are other more complicated things going on in the atmosphere, I'm sure, that kind of led to this very warm winter. I mean, here it is in Wilmington, North Carolina, where I'm working uh, today, and that's where my office is, right here. Uh, 78 degrees right now. That's just crazy. So speaking of uh, weather and warmth and trouble on the horizon, uh, the National Weather Service hazards map, not too active right now. This is more for humidity. Uh, being low, very dry air, windy conditions, etc. out here in the southern plains, eastern New Mexico, northern Texas, etc. So be very careful in this region, please, with anything.
that has to do with sparks and fire and such. Uh, the bigger worry, though, is this right here. Uh, just want to point this out. There are other much more educated severe weather experts than I. When it comes to hurricanes, I hold my own pretty well, I think. But I did want to at least point this out, that yes, we have an active severe weather period coming up here. I want to be able to draw on this. Uh, especially here in parts of the Ohio Valley. Nope, that's not the Ohio Valley. Get your geography right, Mark. In parts of, we'll just call it Indiana, Illinois, uh, eastern Missouri, basically in the areas just east of the typical Tornado Alley spot. And so that means that this region, let me get rid of the telestration because I want you to pay attention to this area. You have enhanced, slight, uh, moderate, etc. Nighttime tornadoes could be a big deal with this. Uh, nocturnal tornadoes as they call them. Uh, please go to SPC. Here we have the Storm Prediction Center. SPC.noaa.gov. Go to the Storm Prediction Center uh, and read these. A moderate outlook, a moderate outlook, a moderate risk of severe weather here for the last day of February. Tomorrow that threat moves eastward. All right, so the Tennessee Valley into the Ohio Valley proper with an enhanced risk right there. So this is unusual for sure, and I need, you know, we won't want you to be back here to see my mug, right, down in, in the future, uh, instead of being hurt by a tornado. So if you know people that live in those areas, in all seriousness, please take that very seriously. Make sure you are weather aware and uh, you don't get caught by surprise, all right? So, you know, really, to sum everything up, we're watching what's happening in the equatorial Pacific. That is one of the biggest drivers, the biggest puzzle pieces to one of them to what may happen in the Atlantic. And again, no major changes, maybe an evolution towards an El Nino. And we'll I'll talk about what type of El Nino, where it's centered, if in fact we think that's going to happen. In the Atlantic Basin, generally war running warmer than normal, no major changes there either. So we're just getting closer, less than 100 days now, to the start of the Atlantic hurricane season. And uh, we'll talk more and more about that uh, as we get into March and beyond. All right? Again, if you uh, saw the last update I did, uh, the tracking the hurricanes, in fact, let me go get rid of the webcam.